The Zulu center had been held in check in the low ground north of the camp by the companies of the 24th. But increasingly, the right flank of the position had become threatened. Durnford's men, fighting in the Donga against the advance of the Zulu left horn, began to withdraw due to ammunition concerns as well as becoming outflanked themselves to the south. As well, the gap between he and Pope's G Company had been infiltrated by small parties of Zulus headed towards the camp. This precipitated a withdrawal of the firing line back up the long stony slope towards the camp and saddle. So began the last phase of the fighting at Islandwana. I'd like to remind the viewer that this is in fact the sixth video in the series of British muzzleloaders in South Africa. If you haven't already, I might recommend watching the other five parts to place this video in its proper context. We take up the story with Colonel Durnford fighting in the Donga with his men of the NNMC. Durnford's position was now untenable. Ammunition was short and although he had sent men back to the camp to get more, they were unable to locate the number two column wagons which held it. The Zulus were also maneuvering on either side and even now were compromising his position. What happened next precipitated the beginning of the end. With a command, Durnford's men, which incidentally may have included some of the men who had formed the outlying vedettes earlier in the day, mounted and began their trip back up the slope to the camp. The Zulus, of course, followed suit. Despite the earlier repositioning of the British right, and with Durnford offering no further resistance, the true threat to the right was now realized. There was nothing stopping the Zulu left horn from sweeping up the slope and into the rear of the British line, not to mention the camp. Pelayne was forced to act immediately, and with great haste. Now the exact sequence of things will never be known, but it would seem that Durnford's abrupt withdrawal set in motion what would eventually be the collapse of the entire position. It's important to realize, however, that this would probably have happened anyway, due to the sheer number of Zulus and the great amount of speed they were using to maneuver. But certainly, significant change to the very foundation of the British plan and position began then. Clearly, a new position was required, as the rocky ridge, however effective it was in holding the Zulu center, was now completely compromised, and there remained only one option. To close the right flank and fall back on the camp. The obvious candidate to begin this movement would have been Pope's G Company, and Lonsdale's NNC, or the remnants thereof, who were by this point more than likely deployed on the right flank, assisting to secure it against the Zulu incursions up the slope. H Company would follow, and so on, until the companies were consolidated closer to the camp. Now personally, I can easily imagine this happening rather suddenly. Durnford had been observed retiring, and what developed must have seemed like a bit of a race to close the flank. There were a number of key events that were all accounted for individually, but must have happened in close relation to one another. One of these events occurred in the Zulu center. The Zulus of the chest had essentially been pinned down by the incessant and effective volleys of the 24th, and they were seeking shelter in the Donga at the base of the rocky ridge. The fire was indeed effective, and it would seem that the advance had stalled. The Zulu commander, atop the escarpment, asked one of his subordinate commanders to go down, restore the resolve of the men, and push on. More than likely, this was done noting that the British right was already beginning to crumble. He ran down the escarpment and made his way to the bottom of the rocky ridge in front of the men. There he stood, oblivious to the bullets falling around him, and admonished the warriors for their cowardly behavior. This direct appeal to their honor had an immediate effect, and the men rose to the attack. Before he could join them, however, he was shot through the forehead. Now, the balance of probability lies with this renewed advance of the Zulu center being directly related to the echelon withdrawal of the British right. This caused a slackening in the fire, which seems to be coincidental with the moment the Zulus chose to renew the attack. Circumstances on the battlefield had certainly changed. Curling of the artillery recalled that the companies near his position moved suddenly and altogether, turning about and retiring. Now they had been holding the Zulus at bay with their fire, 
but as they moved purposely to the rear, they were not obviously firing, and this gave the Zulus the chance to bound forward, which they did with great energy, so much so that the gun was barely limbered before the Zulus were upon it, a gunner being stabbed as he mounted his seat on the axle of the gun. They barely escaped. Perhaps a short pause here to examine some possible methods of withdrawal the companies of the 24th used as they moved from the firing line back towards the camp. We'll never know exactly how this evolution played out, but it would seem that there are some common threads throughout descriptions from both sides, the use of the bugle to signal the beginning of the withdrawal being one of them. But other aspects are shrouded in mystery, and descriptions of others lack clarity. Some accounts have nearly a wholesale withdrawal of almost the entire firing line, moving at the same time. Other speculation paints a much more organic nature to the withdrawal. Let's start by examining the primary source of information regarding this evolution. The 1877 Field Exercise and Evolutions of Infantry. There, the evolutions pertaining to the withdrawal were outlined in the context of the battalion, the company, and even at section level. In order to place the events of the withdrawal at Islandwana in the proper context, we shall examine all three. In the context of a full battalion deployment, any withdrawal of the firing line would be covered by the supports, who were formed some distance to the rear. The supports would themselves deploy into extended order behind the firing line. At a given signal, the firing line would deliver its final fire, then turn about and move back through the supports, taking up position to their rear. Fronting, they would in effect become the new supports. The process would continue, with the companies covering each other as they continued to withdraw. As we've noted in previous videos, the firing line at Islandwana wasn't exactly supported in the conventional textbook sense, in that the supporting elements on the battlefield weren't armed the same way as the main firing line. But, interestingly enough, the manual provides for such an occasion. You'll note here that this passage speaks specifically to a single unsupported company, and that it is to retire by successive sections. As the companies in the firing line were unsupported, it makes sense that each of them would have been treated as though they were a single company as referenced in the manual. Here, we'll show with a full company in rank entire how that evolution may have looked. To place it in the context of the firing line at Islandwana, we'll assume that the line is generally firing, each section controlling its own fire, firing by volleys. The company commander would give his orders. Company will retire by sections from the right. Then, as he saw number one section deliver its last fire, he would order them to retire. With the remaining sections continuing to fire on their own time, as previously examined, number one section, on the right, commanded by a sergeant or even subaltern, would then stand up, turn about, and maneuver to the rear. Their movement complete, they would then halt, front, and deliver fire. The remainder sections, in this case number three section, would continue to volley in addition to number one section. As number two section, the second in sequence, finished their fire, they too would be given the order to withdraw. As the volleys continued to be fired by number four section, number three section would take its turn and move, covered by the fire, in this case by number two and number four section. Taking their place on the new alignment, number three section could then turn about and deliver its fire along with number one section, while number four section moved back to the new alignment. Thus, the line would continue to move to the rear by successive sections, the remaining sections continuing to fire to their front. We can also apply this principle to an even larger group within the company, that being of the half company. You'll see the concept of mutual support permeating every single one of these withdrawal evolutions, and this is no exception. One half of the company would fire, the other half, in this case the right half company, would then move to the rear. Once in position, they would halt, front, and deliver their fire. The left half company would then stand up, turn about, and move back to the new alignment. Thus, the withdrawal would continue by half companies. Musketry, 
could have been controlled at the half-county level, but perhaps control at the section level would still have been maintained. The evolution continued by alternating half-companies, the movement of each covered by the fire coming from the other. Thus far, we've looked at the evolutions as controlled at battalion and company level. These would be effective while the enemy was still at range, as the angles and spacing of the various groupings could still accommodate effective fire. Once the enemy got very close, however, the larger level evolutions could become less effective. In such circumstances, the withdrawal could be devolved down to section level. Here, there is a detailed description of this very evolution. In the article entitled Firing When Retiring, it outlines the concepts of how to conduct a withdrawal at the section level. The line, or parts of the line, or even individuals, can be moved whilst other parts or individuals provide what amounts to covering fire. It goes on to suggest possible schemes in which to achieve this. As noted, these concepts can be used during both an advance as well as during a retirement. At the basic lowest level, and we'll use here a section to demonstrate, the drill is outlined thus. Now remember, although the section is in rank and tire, in effect a single rank, the front rank man and rear rank man are still designated, as before they formed rank and tire, they were in file formation one behind the other. With the section in rank and tire, orders would be issued to coordinate who continues firing and who moves. If we rely on the evidence gained from various accounts of the battle, then the bugle was used to signal the withdrawal. The bugle would have been used at the company level. Direction to the individual sections would come from the section commander. The word of command may have sounded like this. Section will retire by ranks. Front rank commence. Rear rank, retire. Upon the word of command, commence, the front rank man begin independent fire, although this could also be controlled as volley fire. Then, the rear rank man, ordered to retire, would move to the rear, generally about 20 yards, but the exact distance could also be stipulated. Once in their new position, they would halt, front, and prepare to give their fire once their fronts were clear of their file mates. Once the rear rank was ready, the front rank would then be ordered to retire through the intervals of the rear rank men and continue to the rear, fronting and preparing to give their fire in turn. Once their fronts were clear, the rear rank would then deliver their fire, then move through the intervals between the front rank men, and thus the evolution would continue. An alternate form of this drill would have them retire by files, which would see pairs of men moving instead of individuals. Section will retire by files, even files commence, odd files retire. Much like the previous evolution, those designated to fire would do so, either independently or, if ordered to, by volleys. At the same time, the even files would then turn about and move to the rear some 20 yards as before. As they reach their positions in fronted, the odd files would then turn about and move through the intervals of the even files delivering their fire once their frontages were clear. Having delivered their fire, they would then turn about and move through the intervals of the odd files, and so the evolution would continue. These two evolutions, retiring by rank or retiring by file, were evolutions in the micro. Now it might be somewhat difficult to place these low-level evolutions in the context of the greater battle. As we shall see, the withdrawal became increasingly hasty and disjointed the closer it got to the camp and the saddle. I do feel, however, that it's important to explore the tactics as written in the book, as this forms a foundation to our general understanding of how these evolutions were conducted. So we've examined, quite comprehensively, the options available to a commander to retire in contact with the enemy. As alluded to, the companies would have probably begun rearward movement exercising themselves as quasi-independent entities without the benefit of supports to assist. Perhaps, as we shall soon see, the hastening rate and pace of the withdrawal, combined with the building Zulu pressure and their proximity, caused the companies to break down to a degree and exercise a more local form of control at section level.
So, beginning with the initial movement of the right flank, a gradual crescendo of rearward movement, Zulu follow-up, greater haste, and slackening fire was occurring. The faster the British moved, the less they fired. The less they fired, the more opportunity for forward movement on behalf of the Zulus. Remember, Durnford's rearward movement merely precipitated things. There was simply too much frontage and not enough troops to hold the Zulu army back. Although certain individuals had left on other duties well before this point, it was at this, the preliminary stages of the withdrawal, that a greater number of individuals began leaving camp. By most accounts, the withdrawal, though somewhat hasty, was not panicked, and order and control was maintained to a degree in this, the most difficult of military operations, the withdrawal in contact. This point in the battle must have been seen as fluid, yet purposeful, as the Zulu center and chest pressed forward on the heels of the retiring companies. The distances that some of the companies had to travel were considerable, especially those on the right. Some eyewitnesses do indeed place subsequent fighting in front of the camp. By the time they had withdrawn to that point, their files most assuredly must have closed to a degree, with the extensions lessening and the men steeling themselves against what was by this time a full understanding and view of what lay to their front. It wasn't, however, what was to their front necessarily that was the most threatening. It was what was developing, mostly unbeknownst to the men in the firing line, to their flanks and to their rear. The right was still incredibly vulnerable and indeed compromised. One can only imagine the feelings running through the minds of those who were not otherwise busy to their fronts and could look around and see the situation developing. Durnford had withdrawn to a position up on the neck and was busy trying to resupply with ammunition with little success. Critically short, his command was quickly approached and flanked yet again on the high ground to his right. To his left, the Zulus had been able to push into the gap between he and Pope, and at some point the left horn must have been able to get through this gap, up to and around the still withdrawing British right. With men by now running short of ammunition after a long engagement on the rocky ridge, and after a laborious withdrawal up the slope, there must have been a moment that the Zulu maneuver brought about the disintegration of the line. Probably at first just fragments of the right of the line. Four or eight men perhaps. This would quickly grow to larger groups, ten and twenty. With the Zulus beginning to surround them, there was no alternative but to break their formation and prepare to fight from all directions. Men in extended order, indeed in any formation, had a technique whereby if caught unawares or if their loose formation was compromised by cavalry or other fast-moving enemy, they could form what were known as rally groups. This would see a small group, four or six men, come quickly together, back to back, bayonets fixed in preparation for close quarters fighting. As we examine the compromise of the British right, this most assuredly happened. These small groups, fighting face to face if necessary around them, fell back and collected, presumably under their company commander or some other officer or NCO, to form what were known as rally squares. Simply the rally groups come together. The idea was that at that point, with all around defense established and a certain degree of strength, the company could then fight its way to wherever it had to go. So one can imagine the hurried withdrawal becoming increasingly rushed as the Zulus drove up the slope towards the camp and the British rear. The more the line moved, the less it fired. The less it fired, the closer the Zulus got until they were able to get around the flank and punch through the line. Rally groups were quickly formed by those who could and the men standing back to back trying desperately to get towards the remainder of their companies and greater numbers. While some men had been able to slip away during the battle thus far, the vast majority of the men in the firing line continued to fight their way up towards the camp and the neck. As they reached the higher ground, the Zulu battle plan came to fruition. The left and right horns closed in, and they, along with the center, were able to get to close quarters. Thus began the final sorry stage of the battle. Small parties of men fought on, 
all hope of escape lost, while others saw their chance and were able to get away. The route back to Orc's Drift had been blocked by the Zulu right horn, but another route of sorts still lay somewhat open, following a more southerly path. The breaking point finally came as the emboldened Zulus faced a fragmented enemy low on ammunition and were able to push up to and through into the camp. It would seem that the Zulus confronting the British centre were not the first to get amongst the tents and wagons. For essentially undetected, the Zulu right horn was by now firmly established at the back of Islandwana and as yet had already pushed over the neck and into the camp. The Zulu left had been able to overwhelm Durnford near the wagon road, and thus could swing in to close the encirclement. The men on the firing line, who had retired up to, and indeed in some places through the camp, were now faced with their new reality. The Zulus were everywhere, and they were cut off from their ammunition supply. Man by man, and rally square by rally square, the last rounds were thumbed into chambers, the last clouds of smoke belched into the air, and there was nothing left but their bravery and their bayonets. Neither could withstand the crush of the Zulu host for long. Trapped and surrounded, the remaining pockets of British soldiers were overcome at the point of the spear. Though not yet completely over, the battle was as good as won. The camp was overrun, and the Zulu battle plan had ultimately been successful. There had been some elements of the 24th and associated friendly forces who had been able to hold out for a short while. What was more than likely C Company, out on the left flank, had been able to fight and withdraw across the back of the camp and had taken up a position about halfway up the hill of Islandwana. A naturally strong position, there was no way to gain the necessary ammunition for any kind of prolonged fight. So, with all but the most faintest of hope, Young Husband gave a few last words of encouragement. He probably looked into the eyes of his color sergeant and subalterns, who knew too well what he was thinking, and gave the order to charge. Maybe they could get to the wagons as yet and gain some ammunition with which to make a fighting escape. Down the hill they went, their bayonets stretched out and those in the rear following closely on in support. It was all they had left and it proved to be their death ride. As they neared the bottom of the hill, they were consumed, swallowed and surrounded by the mass of Zulus at the neck. Another company, or probably collection of survivors, had been able to fight their way back to just below the neck, where their ammunition failed and were forced to stand firm and meet their enemy who were all around. Eventually, they too were washed away by the superior Zulu numbers, their ammunition exhausted. There was another group, probably of around 40 or so men, who had been able to get across the neck, and seeing the road to Rourke's Drift blocked, were forced, along with many other fugitives, to follow a more southerly route down to the Manzamiyama stream. This group was led by Lieutenant Anstey. They never made it to safety, however, eventually having to stop, harried by Zulus, and make a stand. They too were overcome. In what was perhaps the case of the last survivor, a lone man, more than likely a member of C Company, who had become detached from the rest, hid in a small cave high up on the mountain at the base of the cliffs. He held out for quite some time, but eventually he too was found and killed. The battle proper had not taken that long to transpire. In that short time, one of the most significant defeats ever suffered by the British army had occurred. The Zulu army had won a magnificent and total victory. They had brought their superior numbers to bear, observing the military tenets of surprise, concealment, fieldcraft, speed, aggression, and decisiveness. To them, the laurels must be given. There remain a few aspects of the battle to discuss for further context. The Fugitives In the early stages of the battle, the route back to Rourke's Drift had remained open. Fairly early on, however, the moves made by the Zulu right horn had begun to initially make this road dangerous, and then impassable. 
As the right horn moved down the Manzaminyama Valley, it began to dominate the ground west of Isla Tuana. The flow of personnel was diverted to a more southerly exit from the battlefield, following the Manzaminyama stream. Much like the battle itself, the flight of the fugitives began with perhaps a bit of haste and with small numbers, but quickly developed into a full-scale evacuation of Islanduana by those who could or saw fit to do so. Once pushed to the south, the route was governed by the low ground, and this was followed initially. After a mile or two, the hurried retreat made by the escapees took to crossing the Manzaminyama. This led to a traverse along a long slope that ran in a southwesterly direction. To the south lay the Buffalo River, which was in flood at the time of the battle, and its steep banks prevented an easy crossing. This pushed the route to the west, where the ground opened up to a degree and a crossing could be made. This point has become known as Fugitive's Drift, and marked somewhat of a psychological point of safety. Although generally there was not much Zulu activity south of the river, there were notable exceptions. It cannot be overstated to say that the flight from the battlefield was an orderly or easily assessed evolution. While it may have begun through prudence, as in the case of John Chard, it certainly did not maintain any kind of orderly or even organized form. Once the Zulus had cut the road to Rourke's Drift and had begun to infiltrate the camp from behind, understandably, panic and self-preservation were the mitigating factors. Those who escaped were exceptionally lucky and, for the most part, do not reflect the plight of those on the firing line. For them, their fates were generally sealed. The initial fugitives weren't even fugitives at all. Men such as John Chard of the Royal Engineers, who had come up from Rourke's Drift earlier in the morning, was in the camp long enough to see the initial stages of the Zulu deployment above the Nyoni Ridge. He was alarmed at what he believed to be the Zulus demonstrating to the west and having no duties in camp, and in fact his primary task actually was at Rourke's Drift, he quickly returned there before the road was threatened. His story will of course come later. While the battle had begun to a degree, action had not yet been joined. Once it did, however, an ominous shadow fell over the battlefield. The Zulu masses, maneuvering, and initial contacts perhaps were enough for the first personnel to put to their heels. The civilian contractors, the wagon drivers and their verlopers, for the most part, began to trickle out of camp over the saddle. Added to these were substantial numbers of the NNC and NNMC as well as perhaps less scrupulous volunteers. We could perhaps concede that it wasn't until action became fully joined and the Zulu intentions became clear, and indeed that some Zulus, particularly those of the right horn, became active behind the camp, that some military personnel who, while certainly bound by duty, found themselves without function and chose to leave. Some undoubtedly left for selfish reasons and could otherwise have stayed, but some left with specific tasks. Men like the interpreter, Brickhill, left the camp fairly late, once the withdrawal had begun, but with the camp not yet overrun. Lieutenant Curling of the artillery also exited the battlefield, after withdrawing with the guns from the firing line. His mounted command obviously outpaced the infantry, who were fighting their way up the slope, and had initially intended to come into action on the saddle. Once they arrived there, the Zulus had already made their approach from around Islanduana, and the guns were overrun with many of his gunners killed. Curling barely escaped on horseback. His story is of particular note, as in the time it took for the guns to make their way to the camp, leaving the infantry fighting slowly back up the slope, the Zulus had already gained the neck from the rear. Smith Dorian, one of the column's transport officers, had busied himself early, organizing and delivering ammunition to the line. This he continued to do until the ammunition supply became compromised by the same Zulus of the right horn. The withdrawal had been underway for some time by this point, and with Zulus infiltrating into the camp, he could no longer fulfill his task, and narrowly escaped on horseback. Perhaps the most celebrated escapees were two officers, Lieutenants Melville and Coghill. Melville was the adjutant of the 1st Battalion, and Coghill was on the staff of Number 3 Column. At a point fairly late on, once the position began crumbling, the decision to save the Queen's Colour of the 1st Battalion was made. It would seem that this was a conscious decision made in the heat of the moment at the point it was realised the position was lost. 
Every battalion in the British Army, with the exception of the rifles, had two colours in their possession, the Queen's and the Regimental. The Regimental colour of the 1st Battalion had been left at Heltmakar, but the Queen's colour of both battalions had been brought into Zululand. These were supremely important regimental items, and were the physical embodiment of the unit's history and tradition. In 1879, they were still brought into the field. Melville, it would seem, being the adjutant, was given this task by Pauline, and he rushed to the tent where it was kept. Despite artwork to the contrary, the colour was more likely than not still in its case, a long leather arrangement with a brass cap. Melville quickly assumed control of the colour, and on horseback made his way out of the camp, over the saddle, and down towards the Manzamiyama. Coghill, who was on Glynn's staff, had been injured in the knee and had not participated meaningfully in the action thus far. It would seem that he left camp around the same time as Melville. At some point, the two met up and remained together until the end. There, amongst the panic scene of men and horses, they made to cross the raging swollen river. Melville was thrown from his horse in the tumbling water and was carried downstream by the current. He caught a rock to which Lieutenant Higginson of the NNC was also clinging. Coghill, who had been able to keep his horse across the river, came back to help, but Zulu fire killed his mount as he splashed back into the river. The three were able to make it to the other side, but not before the current ripped the colour from Melville's hands, where it disappeared downstream. After stumbling to the Natal bank of the river, they began to make their way up the steep, rocky slopes. They were not yet, however, out of harm's way, for a party of Zulus, either in pursuit from the main army, or others who lived on the Natal side that were intimidated into hunting down any survivors, were as yet closing in on their position. At some point, the three men were caught up to, and the men defended themselves briefly with their revolvers. Higginson somehow saw fit to leave the two, who were exhausted and could hardly continue. He carried on up the slope to safety. Both Melville and Coghill were killed on that stony slope as they struggled to get to the top, utterly spent by the day's ordeal. Today, their graves mark where they fell, a poignant reminder to the flight of the fugitives. Now, there has only been mention of but a few men who were able to remove themselves from the battlefield, but there remain many more. Private Wassel of the 80th Regiment, serving in the Mounted Infantry Section, made it to Fugitive's Drift, and for his actions to save a comrade under fire, was later awarded the Victoria Cross. Both Melville and Coghill would, in the first instances of a posthumous award of the Victoria Cross, be recipients as well. There are many other tales of bravery and narrow escapes, but these stories can simply not be contained all within the space of this video. The victory had been total, and the Zulu army had completely overwhelmed the British at the camp. They had maneuvered masterfully, concealed their army, and attacked decisively. The small number of men at the camp never really stood a chance. There had been enormous bravery shown on both sides. In the immediate aftermath of the action, the Zulus partook in their post-battle ceremonies. One such part included a ritual evisceration of the dead. This gruesome practice, while completely normal and done as a matter of course to the vanquished, it nevertheless proved to be a point of contention when the bodies were later discovered where they fell. For the British, there was simply no one left at the camp, and an eerie calm descended. The column, of course, was not completely wiped out, and as the flying column, positioned as it was at the Mangeni, was in fact the more powerful of the two groups. It, of course, was near completely intact. If we can remember, earlier that morning, Chelmsford, still focused on finding the Zulus where he thought they were, had sent Commandant Brown's 1st Battalion of the 3rd NNC back to the camp to assist Pauline in breaking it in preparation to move it forward. On the way back, Brown captured a Zulu scout who had indicated the Zulu intentions and, shortly thereafter, had advanced sufficiently far enough to be able to see the obvious signs of battle ensuing at the camp. He could plainly see and hear the action that was yet developing, and he again sent word to Chelmsford. 
Realizing that he was isolated and outnumbered, he wisely chose to take some nearby high ground and assume a defensive position and await Chelmsford's arrival. Chelmsford had earlier ordered the flying column to cease their skirmishing activities against the small numbers of Zulus in the area and assemble at the proposed campsite on the plain above the gorge of the Mangeni. Brown had in fact sent multiple messages, and it wasn't until he received the third communication from Brown that he decided to act. Heading off in front of the flying column, Chelmsford met Brown near the NNC defensive position. There he was informed of the reality of the situation. It was by now evening, and Brown brought the general up to speed. Initially curt and disbelieving with his response, Chelmsford quickly became aware as to the reality of the calamity that had occurred at the camp. This was made doubly so by the arrival of a singular Commandant Lonsdale who had actually been to the camp and had narrowly escaped. Realizing that his main effort needed to be focused squarely on the camp, Chelmsford then sent message and ordered up the flying column. They arrived as darkness approached. The flying column then mounted an operation to retake the camp. They approached from the general direction that Durnford had withdrawn over, initially seizing the high ground at Malabamkosi and then moving up onto the saddle. There was no organized resistance and all that was left of the Zulu army were some remnants, drunken and easily overpowered. The flying column would camp that night amongst the ashes of the tents, the destroyed equipment and hundreds of mutilated bodies. The night was not interrupted by any attacks as the Zulus had in fact retired. What became apparent was off to the distant west. The mission station at Works Drift was under attack and musketry from that location, delivered by the beleaguered garrison, could be heard. The morning would see the remnants of Number 3 Column move purposely back to Works Drift, falling back on their lines of communication. Abandoning the battlefield, the Battle of Islam Dwana was over. The defeat put the British and indeed the whole invasion on the defensive. Rourke's Drift was fortified and it took some time before conditions were right for a return to the battlefield. In preparation for the second invasion, it had been deemed necessary to recover the wagons still left at Islam Dwana. An expedition was mounted in May of 1879 to retrieve them. The other duty was, of course, to finally bury the dead, which had been lying exposed for five months. It was gruesome work, but the efforts of those who performed it are still in evidence today. They were buried generally where they fell. In subsequent years, cairns of stones were painted white, and memorials were erected to the various units that fought in the battle the Natal Carboneers, the Natal Mounted Police, the Volunteers, and of course the 24th Foot. These were joined much later by an appropriate Zulu memorial. Today, the battlefield is included in a wide expanse of parkland. Sadly, this does little to stop vandals and thieves from routinely desecrating graves and memorials. The shapes and contours of the ground remain readily identifiable. It is quite an isolated place, accessed by dirt road only. That said, it is well worth any amount of time and effort to get there. And once you've visited in the shadow of the mountain, you will never forget it. So this brings us to the end of Part 3D of the series, Chapter 4 of the Islam Duana story. I must admit, the project has grown out of all expectations, and I hope it has proven to be enjoyable. There remains one more video on Islam Dwana within the series, one that will be dedicated to some analysis and deeper examination of specific aspects of the battle. I hope that the details covered here have proven to be interesting, and the examination thus far has been clear and concise enough to impart a good general understanding of the battle. That said, it does remain an example of how I interpret the various events of that fateful day, and must be viewed in the context of a mere drop in the bucket of the greater study of the battle and the Anglo-Zulu War in general. I've tried to include some aspects 
predominantly tactical in nature, which although are perhaps speculative, are not necessarily covered in other examinations. I hope that these are seen as somewhat useful. Thank you so much for watching. As with the previous videos in the series, the works of Ian Knight and Colonel Mike Snook have proven indispensable. Ian also kindly provided some photographs for use here. Many thanks go to Georgina for the use of some of her photographs. She was our official photographer for our trip to South Africa. And of course, to A Company 24th Foot, the group that made our trip and this video possible. Thanks as well go to Alan, who allowed the use of his painting in the video. Prints are available at the link below. For all your Snyder or Martini reloading needs, talk to Martin at X-Ring Services. If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below. And for more information on projects and updates between videos, follow us on our Facebook page.